The apocalyptic times of the trumpets. Good morning or good afternoon or good, e good evening, depending on the time and place you're tuning into this message. We've reached perhaps the most important part of the apocalyptic war trumpets. Because if there's something that differentiates historicists from other schools of interpretation, it's the prophetic dates based on the biblical principle of a day for a year. This historicist approach was represented during the whole Christian dispensation by Jews and Christians alike. Indeed, those who neglect the prophetic dates tend to fall into interpretive idealism, preterism, or futurism. Initially, they may argue that they remain historicists, but eventually they spiritualize the content of the prophecies of Daniel and John. As a result, they begin inventing philosophies that strip the apocalypse of its basic historical content. And even if they accept the prophetic fulfillment of apocalyptic dates, rejecting one of those dated prophecies, in the case of preterists or idealists, or interpreting it literally instead of the day for a year principle in the case of futurists, the inconsistency ultimately leads to abandoning the historicist approach. Exactly. They introduce here an inconsistency into prophetic interpretation. Why accept something here and not there? Why give only symbolic value in one place apart from any historic date or event, yet in another place associate something with a specific calendar date? Why apply a literal interpretation in one place and a prophetic interpretation in another? Ultimately, the tendency to reject one or more of the prophetic dates involving the day for a year principle in the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation hides a more basic problem, unbelief. It's easier for them to approach the topic from a generalized perspective, as vague as possible, to make it more palatable for skeptics. The same happens with the identification of the Roman Antichrist through the number of his name, 666, according to the book of Revelation. And we see the same with the identification of the woman Babylon and the seven mountains on which she sits. They try to avoid identifying her by her blasphemous name and her clearly specified residence in the book of Revelation. What are the dated prophecies in the books of Daniel and Revelation? Can they all be explained from the historicist perspective that counts a day as a year? That is the only way they can be interpreted. For example, the prophecy of the 2,300 days in Daniel 8.14 has no acceptable preterist explanation. Attempts have been made to connect it literally to the invasion of the Seleucid king Antiochus Epiphanes in the second century before Christ. But such attempts have failed utterly. None of the dates they have used to fit it into that great history align with the, spe with the specifications. And since the preterist approach claims that prophecies do not exist, but are only predictions made after the events have occurred, some have even said that the biblical writer wrote shortly before the events were fulfilled, providing only an approximate date, but without really knowing the precise, precise time. Even the preterist principle of post-eventum, as they call it in Latin for interpreting prophecy, fails in this case, because one has to ask, what's the purpose of the Bible if we take away its transcendent value? For more... From what I see, the prophetic dates of Revelation 9 are in the fifth and sixth trumpets, representing God's judgments against apostate Rome. 
both Roman Catholic and Orthodoxy. This frames the expansive period of Muslim invasions against a spurious and tyrannical Christianity. On the other hand, in Protestant historicism, the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation concerning the 1260 and the 1290 years are traditionally seen as that period of Roman papal dominance. Correct. There are no dated prophecies related to the martyrdom of pagan Rome, but there are with the martyrdom caused by papal Rome. This may be another reason why the punishments are more severe in the last three war trumpets that uh, turn into woes, more encompassing misfortunes that fall upon apostate Christianity. Because in addition to having more light or knowledge of the word of God than the ancient pagan Romans, they revealed a greater cruelty towards those who did not submit to their arbitrary dogmas. Some Catholic historians like Will Duran even acknowledge this. Let's read one of his comparisons. Compared with the persecution of heresy in Europe from 1227 to 1492, the persecution of Christians by the Romans in the first three centuries after Christ was a mild and humane procedure, making every allowance required of an historian and permitted to a Christian, we must rank the Inquisition as among the darkest blots on the record of mankind, revealing a ferocity unknown in any beast. W. Durant, The Age of Faith, page 784. Could that be why the Bible depicts the papacy as the beast of Revelation 13? Since the Inquisition courts were founded and controlled by the popes themselves, and some popes were even inquisitors who inflicted torture on those they considered heretics. Our empires are represented in the books of Daniel and Revelation by wild beasts because they were all cruel. But the last one, the Roman papacy, was portrayed as a monster with ten horns because it reigned alongside the ten barbarian kingdoms that founded Europe. And none of them are talked about in the apocalyptic prophecies as much as the one that represented the papacy. They assigned it a specific uh, time period of 1260 and 1290 years, taking into account two specific context that helped frame its historical fulfillment more precisely and comprehensively. So what were those dates from the perspective of their fulfillment? If we delve into the detailed fulfillment of the prophetic days in the books of Daniel and Revelation, we will have to spend many hours on the dates of the apocalyptic trumpets alone. Therefore, let me refer to the book I wrote displayed on the screen where you will find the most detailed study of all the apocalyptic dates in the Bible with precise documentation general, generally confirmed by historians. The Apocalyptic Times of the Sanctuary is the title of that book. Let's content ourselves here with the results of that historical documentation. I have more documentation in other papers that you can find uh, on my webpage. Daniel and John in Revelation speak of a period of 1,260 days or 42 months or a time, year, two times, two years, and half a time, meaning half a year. They represent the time of the supremacy of the medieval Antichrist that would come from the pagan Roman Empire. These three ways of expressing the same period of 1,260 years, whether in days, months, or times, must be fulfilled beginning after the fall of the Roman Empire in the West. So how do we historically frame that prophesied time span? Regarding the period of paper supremacy, the dates that have been based on a sliding or variable scale 
range from the year 533 to 1793 and from 500, uh, 538 to 1798. Both dates cover an exact period of 1260 years respectively. The first date of the year 533 is based on a decree or rather an edict as it was called, issued by the Emperor Justinian, declaring that the Bishop of Rome should be considered the head of all churches and addressed that Pope with a blasphemous title, His Holiness. He also committed to affirming the Pope's authority throughout the empire. This edict could not be militarily implemented before the year 538. It was then that Justinian's general, Belisarius, seized control of Rome from the Ostrogoths, who opposed the Bishop of Rome and were ruling the city. The Ostrogoths were defeated, banished, and not permitted to return. From then on, the Pope would be free to exercise the authority conferred by Justinian in Rome. Let's move to the end point of the 1260 years. In the first mentioned date, we find the decision of the French National Assembly to de-Christianize France in the year 1793. This decision was militarily implemented in 1798 by General Berthier of Napoleon's army, who went to Rome and took the Pope prisoner, declaring that from then on the papacy should no longer exercise its authority. That word, authority, spoken at the beginning and end of the 1260-year period, perfectly fulfilled the prophecy specified in Revelation 13, which stated that the Roman Empire would give the Pope his throne and authority. The prophet Daniel also referred to that despotic rule of the papacy that would succeed the Roman Caesars by the date expressed as a time, times, and half a time, that is, 1,260 years as we can read in Daniel 7, verse 25. But he also referred to a period of 1,290 years that would begin once the heavenly intercession of Christ for that imposter antichrist was removed on the earth and the abomination of horror was established in its place instead. Daniel 12, verse 11. What does that desolating or horrifying abomination refer to? The word abomination is related to a horrifying idolatry, the worst of all. It has to do uh, with the establishment of a system of government where the Antichrist sits in the midst of the church, pretending to be God, which is a living idolatry that causes consternation in all of heaven due to such audacity. The Apostle Paul announced it in 2 Thessalonians 2, interpreting the prophecies of Daniel. And when did that happen? When, when were those 1,290 years of horrifying idolatrous abomination fulfilled? I understand that the Pope's claim to be the vicar of Christ and of God in a blasphemous way requiring people to kneel before him to ask for forgiveness in the confessional is that idolatrous abomination mentioned in the Bible. Yes, the Bible states that only God can forgive sins because he alone knows the hearts of human beings. 1 Kings uh, 8.39 The Son of God also has that authority according to the Gospels because the Son also has the ability to read hearts, John 2, 25. To locate the 1290 years, we must bear in mind the reality that Rome, more precisely the papacy, was experiencing. The barbarian or Germanic peoples who had invaded the empire until its fall were not Latin or Catholic, but Aryan Christians. 
the first Germanic king to convert to Roman Catholicism was Clavis. There is a debate about whether his baptism took place in the year 508 or a little later, but a day that no one disputes is that he made Paris the capital of his kingdom under a system or of government where the church was united with the state. He launched his military campaign against other barbarian peoples who did not accept Catholicism. In other words, from the year 508 onwards, we find the first system of government that imposed the Roman Catholic religion on the entire Frankish kingdom, officially removing Christ's intercession by giving it to Catholic priests and placing in its place the supreme idolatry of the Pope. There's no need to revisit the end point, as from the year 508 to 1798, exactly 1290 years are fulfilled as predicted. When that idolatrous abomination is officially removed from Christendom. From then on, no one would be obliged to kneel before any Roman priest or pope. But we can highlight a remarkable fact. The same tribe that imposed the papal idolatrous abomination was the one that later removed it, the tribe of the Franks in the atheistic French Revolution. And keep in mind that this tribe was the most loyal to the papacy in all of history. It was even the first to establish the Inquisition courts, which tortured million, millions of people along the centuries. Well, thank you, Dad, for this quick overview of the dated prophecies that involved the despotic rule of medieval papacy. Let's now move on to the dates of the fifth and the sixth trumpets. Let's start with the fifth war trumpet. John repeats twice that its expansion would last five months, which equates to 150 days or years in its apocalyptic fulfillment. How was that prophecy fulfilled in history? Well done, Roy. In pointing out that the 150-year period is mentioned twice. There were two periods of Muslim expansion into the apostate Christian world of Rome, first by the Saracen Arabs and then by the Ottoman Turks in their initial advances. Let's first examine the Protestant interpretation that saw the beginning of the 150-year period uh, in Muhammad's first inflammatory preaching. There is a debate about uh, whether Muhammad's first vision occurred in the year 610 or 612. Initially, he feared being possessed by the demon. However, one of his wives encouraged him to listen to the revelations he believed he later received from the angel Gabriel. And in the year 612, he was tasked with preaching the vision he had, visions he had received. If we go forward 150 years from the year 612, we arrive at the year 762, when the foundation stone of Baghdad, the new Muslim capital, was laid. Its founder, Al-Mansur, named it Dar es Salaam, House of Peace and employed about 400 architects, artisans, and workers to build it. The construction of the city was completed four years later, later, surpassing all other cities in the East. The very name of this capital marked a stark contrast with the previous military incentive of Muslim expansion, which was to harm and torment men according to prophecy. Let's hear the testimony of historians. The fall of the Umayyads and the removal of the Caliphate to Baghdad marks the end of the first era of Muslim history. I understand there is also a 150-year period of Muslim expansion from a military perspective. 
Could you explain how this event unfolded within the specified expansion period? Sure. From a military perspective, we find that Abu Bakr, the first caliph of successor of Muhammad, initiated his first expansive military campaign in the year 632. It was he who, as we saw, admonished his soldiers with the words of the fifth trumpet to guard the vegetation. This Muslim expansion by the Saracens is historically considered the first expansion of Islam. Its expansionist spirit, characterized by prophecy as harming and tormenting, lasted exactly a century and a half. His historians assert that it was then that, for the first time, Islam became a military and political force throughout Arabia. Under the rule of Abu Bakr, the first advances began. You can read them in some encyclopedias. So what happened five prophetic months later, a century and a half later, or 150 literal years later, in the year 782? Arun al-Rashid, the powerful caliph of Baghdad, then a general, reached the gates of the Eastern Roman Empire's capital, Constantinople, and initiated a siege that ended in a peace treaty. Instead of continuing his advance, he chose to halt his expansion on good terms. This treaty marked a shift in the political trend of harming men. Harun al-Rashid's subsequent battles aimed to consolidate his positions. The invading power of the caliphate was also lost when he divided his caliphate among his sons, leading to independent caliphates by the end of the 8th century. At that time, Charlemagne reigned in France, whom the Romans considered the first of all the conquerors of the Saracens. Many contribute considerable importance to Charlemagne because he was later crowned as Emperor of the Holy Roman Empire by Pope Leo III. In that ceremony, he was confirmed as the defender of the Catholic religion, although the popes had already been seeking the help of the Frankish kings to face the Lombards and the Muslims invading their domains from the south. What is significant in our study is that Harun al-Rashid developed a special friendship with Charlemagne. On the other hand, the Eastern Roman Empire, or the Byzantine, Byzantine Empire, as it is also called, headquartered in Constantinople, strengthened its resistance and cleared southern Italy and the Mediterranean of Muslim influence. Many years passed before a new expansive Muslim spirit arose, that of the Ottoman Turks, to invade the apostate medieval civilization. But let's hear from the historians. We are told that Harun al-Rashid's military campaign from 781 to 782 was highly successful because the Abbasid army reached the shores of uh, the Bosphorus for the first and last time. The reign of Harun al-Rashid is generally considered the pinnacle of Abbasid power, but it is at this moment that the first signs of decline are seen. The caliphate reached its peak of power, wealth, and culture in his time, but if his reign coincided with a historical curve, personally, it had more to do with the fall than the rise. So in other words, in the two proposed dates, we see the same period of time, but on a sliding and or variable scale, ranging from the year 612 to 762, and from the year 632 to 782, precisely a 150 year period. And during all that time when Islam lost its expansive spirit, were there no confrontations between Christians and Muslims? The harassment continued but not in a coordinated manner as it had been during the 150-year period. 
The Arabs lacked a coordinated and widespread advance. What we see are rather wandering hordes of Arabs attacking caravans and looting cities to withdraw later. In European internal conflicts, we sometimes find European kings introducing Muslims into Italy to limit the power of the Pope they were opposed to. This is very interesting, but what was the next Muslim wave of 150 years that fulfilled the second period of 150 years of the fifth trumpet? You can see in the following slide the two expansive waves of Muslim invasion that lasted 150 years each. If we consider that the sixth trumpet of war begins with the fall of Constantinople, which until that time prevented the Ottoman Turks from advancing into the realms supporting the Holy Roman Empire, we must look for those 150 years not only under the Arab invasion, but also under the Turkish Ottoman invasion before the fall of the Byzantine Empire. This uh, led Millerites and Adventists who emerged from that movement to emphasize this second 150-year period between 1299 and 1449. What happened then? On July 27, 1299, the first Ottoman battle took place in Bafius, alerting the Byzantine Empire to the Muslim danger. The contemporary historian Pachimers referred to that battle as a serious defeat in Book 10, Chapter 25, for the Byzantines. And he added, it was therefore the beginning of great uh, troubles for the entire region at a time when the harvest of the fruits of the earth was urgent. Based on Pachimere's modern historian as, where and when does Ottoman history begin? The Byzantines first consider Osman and his tribe worthy of special observation and care in the battle between the forces of Osman and Musalon in Bafius, a place just outside Nicomedia. For the Byzantine chronicle, George Pachimeres, Osman became a man worth watching as a result of the Battle of Bafius. Osman, an insignificant Turkish leader from Bithynia, made his first solid appearance in history here. Other Turks rallied under his banner, and these combined forces threatened Nicomedia. This victory was a crucial importance to Osman's ability to assume a leadership position among the various Turkish chiefs. The ultimate result of this process was to be the foundation of the Ottoman Empire. And why was the day of July 27, 1299, questioned so much later? Pachimeris gave the day and month of that battle, but not the year. It took place on July 27. But Pusinus in the 17th century and uh, Edward Gibbon in the 18th century concluded that the Battle of Bafios occurred in the year 1299. Followers of William Miller, like Josiah Leach, relied on Gibbon's work to establish that date as the starting point. But later, from Joseph von Hammer in the 19th century, most historians have been dating that battle first in 1301 and then in 1302. Consequently, the most represented historical position today is that Bafius fell to the Turks on July 27, 1302. To clarify this debate, you bought the four tremendous volumes of Pachimeres that were translated into French. What conclusion did you reach from reading all of those volumes? I obtained that historical encyclopedia of Pachimeres at a special price of $500. 
but I had to get the bottom of the issue to be sure of what I was going to write. And I found that most contemporary authors, Arabs, Mongols, and Byzantines, had been translated into French, since many Seventh-day Adventist interpreters did not know French and lacked the research possibilities we have to date on the internet, they were confused by the later date established by Joseph von Hammer. What conclusion did I reach? That several historical facts make it impossible to date the Battle of Bafius so far from its historical context. In fact, Turkish historians today insist that the Ottoman Empire was founded in 1299, although they sometimes also confuse the day given today for the Battle of Bafius in 1302. Did you publish your historical findings in any scientific research medium? I think it would be good to make it known if so. Yes, you can see in the next slide the scientific journal that published my paper. It is titled, The Chronology of Events in the History of Paki Mers, related to the Battle of Bafius and the beginning of the Ottoman Empire in the International Journal of Humanities and Social Science, Volume 7, Number 8, August 2017. Before publishing it, the administrators of that scientific journal gave it to specialists in the field to see if the article needed shortening. But those scholars concluded that, that they should leave the entire study intact and publish it as I send it. So what has been the reaction you have received from scholars on the topic? Yes, even before publishing it, I included their comments at the end of the study. I also presented this topic and others related to the days of the trumpets at a pastoral retreat of the Seventh-day Adventist Michigan Conference in the United States of America, which took place from July 31st to August 3, 2017. So most of the feedback you got was positive, but going back to that battle, do you know if the Byzantine Empire understood the Battle of Baphius as being a punishment of God for the Christian apostasy specifically? Because in light of the fifth trumpet, that battle has to be really important to mark the beginning of the second wave of God's scourges on the empire. Yes, Pachymers wrote, that those who protected the city of Bafius understood that the destruction of its walls but by a powerful hurricane was a manifestation of God's wrath, and the fall of Bafius was likewise seen in the empire, especially among the priests, as an evil that came from God. They didn't know, however, that this was true even from an apocalyptic perspective. They were suffering the beginning of the 150 years of the divine scourge anticipated in the fifth trumpet. Could you summarize the basic reasons you found for rejecting von Hammer's proposed date for the Battle of Baphius in 1302? Certainly. There are more reasons that I cannot mention here due to time constraint, but I'll briefly highlight the issues with uh, von Hammer that led him to choose an incorrect date for that crucial early Ottoman battle. He incorrectly identified the Battle of Koyun Hisar with the Battle of Bafius. There are no historical records indicating the day for the Battle of Koyun Hisar, and the description of the two battles do not match according to modern historians. He failed to notice that when describing the Battle of Bafius, Pachymers went back to the year 1299. This was his style to tell history. Number three, the hurricane that uh, flooded Bafius in March, destroying its defenses and facilitating its capture, aligns with the year 1299, not the years from 1300 to 1303. 
Ancient chronicles show that the severe storm described by Pachymers occurred in the 1299 in the same month of March, referred to by Pachymers, occasionally happening today as Medicanes, that is, Mediterranean hurricanes. Medi, uh, hurricanes, Medicanes. The following years were characterized by dry weather. Fourth, drought for three years from 1300 to 1302 confirms July 27, 1299 as the only possible date for the Battle of Bafius. Fifth, Turkish history and recent numismatic evidence suppose the year 1299. Six. A letter from Bishop Athanasius to the Emperor in Thessaloniki, urging his immediate return to face the Muslim threat, can only be dated between August and October of 1299, since Pachymers claimed that the Battle of Bafius triggered fear in the Empire uh, as the first uh, manifestation how is it possible today that battle in 1302? Seven, Turkish historians place the date for the beginning of the Ottoman Empire in the year 1299, not in the year 1302. So you just gave us seven solid reasons why you rejected von Hammer's findings. Um, and undoubtedly there is more historical evidence supporting the date of the Battle of Bafius in 1299. But let's move on from here. What happened 150 years later? There are several additional historical pieces of evidence, of evidence provided in the study I prepared and published in the International Journal of Humanities and Social Science. However, I believe the seven points I mentioned are sufficient. As for what happened 150 years later, in 1449, Josiah Leach observed that the last emperor of the Byzantine Empire, Constantine Paleologus, was crowned after seeking permission from the Turkish Sultan. Such submission exposed that the ultimate authority over the Byzantine Empire was henceforth the Sultan, who, four years later, in 1453, uh, broke down Constantinople, ultimately ending the Eastern Roman Empire. Yeah, that's amazing that the four sultanates were unleashed to break the imperial barrier that prevented them from av advancing freely and deeper into the Holy Roman Empire, as we saw with our previous discussion. Let's now consider the given date for the sixth trumpet. I understand that there has been a lot of debate in recent times about interpreting the verses that speak of the judgment period of the sixth trumpet, not only from the biblical perspective, but also the historical one. So it'd be good to start by reading the biblical text. The discussion begins with determining how to translate and understand Revelation 9.15. Protestants understood historically that this verse projects a duration in time. Let us read. And the four angels who had been kept ready for this very hour and day and month and year were released to kill a third of men. This, is, this can be seen even today in several versions. However, influenced by the Enlightenment and subsequent rise of historical criticism of the Bible, this approach has been discarded by most contemporary interpreters of Revelation. They prefer to give the sixth trumpet a punctual time, that is, one specific date. But, as Dr. Tarsi Lee responds, this text, Revelation 9.15, cannot be used as an argument against the historicist method of interpretation. 
There is no grammatical rule that can be invoked to deny a time implied in the prophecy of the sixth trumpet. Contrary to, contrary to what we are led to believe, the historicist interpretation is perfectly defensible exegetically. You may read in the screen the references of the papers of Dr. Lee. And does this discussion of whether the time reference is punctual or extends to a period really matter? Because if we want to see the sixth trumpet as an answer to when, it would be in the specific time of 391 days or years. But if we choose to see the text as an answer to for how long, the interpretation could be expressed as being for 391 days or years. The conclusion may be exactly the same. So does it matter? Exactly. That is the conclusion Dr. Tarsi Lee reached. He also states that if we feel uncomfortable with the way God chose to determine a time span, a formula, formula of day and month and year, it is because uh, we have forgotten that God chose a similar formula as we saw at the beginning of this dialogue for the 1260 days or 42 months, that is time, times, and half a time. What can we say about the 1,000 years of peace announced toward the end of the book of Revelation? Are they symbolic or literal? I don't care about that because the millennial peace will take place in the afterlife where the devil will not be able to deceive anyone. The redeemed will be in heaven and the wicked will be dead. There will be a rest for the earth although under the course of desolation. But there will be a wonderful life happening during that time in heaven, free forever from Satan's tricks. Jesus had to speak in parables because the people were unable to understand clearly the heavenly realities. And the Apostle Paul said that in this time of eternity, we know and prophesy in part until everything will be complete. Let us read what Jesus and the Apostle Paul said. In John 3, 12, we read, I have spoken to you of earthly things, and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? And in 1 Corinthians 13, verses 9 through 12, Now we know in part and prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. For presently we see through a glass in obscurity, but then face to face. Presently I know in part, but then I will know fully. The text we just considered mentions not only a day and a month, 30 thematic or prophetic days, and a year, 360 thematic or prophetic days, but also an hour. Should the hour be given a prophetic projection in time as well? On that point, there have been two positions among Protestant historicists after the fall of Constantinople. While some assigned a temporal value to the hour, others interpreted it as a reference to the entire period of the sixth trumpet judgment. The translation would be in the second case, the four angels who had been kept ready for this very hour of judgment were released still or for a day, a month and a year. If a day equals a year in apocalyptic interpretation, a prophetic hour for a 24-hour day would be equivalent to 15 literal days, half a month because the year has 12 months. How did Protestant interpreters who did not grant a time frame to the hour interpret this prophecy long before its final fulfillment? They took the year of 1453 with the fall of the capital of the Byzantine Empire as the reference point and counted 391 years later to the year 1844 as their end point. 
They believe that starting from that day, the Turkish Ottoman harassment of Europe would come to an end. And what about those who assigned the value of 15 days to the hour? How did they project the fulfillment in history for 391 years and 15 days? Because that requires a defined starting point as well. The Millerites, who relied on Josiah Leach's calculations, later adopted by the Adventists, agreed that they should combine the time prophecies of the fifth and sixth trumpets to get a sum of 150 years plus 391 years and 15 days, totaling 541 years and 15 days. By starting the two joint dates on July 27, 1299, they arrived at August 11, 1840. Thus, two years before the set date's expiration, they predicted that something significant regarding the Ottoman Empire would uh, happen. And what happened on August 11, 1840? Did the Ottoman Empire fall? Did it put an end to the policy of harassing and then killing or destroying with which this Turkish empire had started? Many even expected the possible fall of the Ottoman Empire on that day. But when the appointed date arrived, the newspapers reported the sub submission of the Turkish Sultan to the higher powers of Europe on that very day. So, for the Millerites, the submission of the last Byzantine emperor to the Sultan and then the submission of the Turkish Sultan to European nations became fulfilled prophecies. This impressive fulfillment of the prophecy on the exact day anticipated by Leach two years early strengthened the Millerite message announcing the end of the 2,300 years by 1843 and subsequently with better calculations by October 22, 1844. So do uh, modern historians now put relevance on the date of August 11, 1840, or is that only relevant for historicist Adventists? Yes, even today, historians recognize the significance of that date. To ensure my research was thorough, I went to the public library in Atlanta, Georgia, and spent hours in the historical section related to that period. It's worth mentioning that a little miracle occurred. To enter, I needed an access card, which I didn't have. One or two days later, we were moving to North Carolina, and at the moment when I arrived at the library, the power went out. The person in charge of controlling entry stepped away for a moment, and not knowing the procedure, I was able to enter. But where could I find the information I needed? They told me at the counter, to check the catalogs. But I wanted to work directly with the books in hand and quickly. I was informed that this section was on the sixth floor, but only professionals in the field with special permission could access it. I found the stairs and I clambered all six floors. There I spent hours enthralled by the most recent information I could find. I even discovered a recently published English language Turkish historical encyclopedia, in English, encyclopedia, with fabulous information for me. Did the power come back on afterward, or did they give you trouble when leaving? Yes, there was uh, the guard controlling the entrance and exit. He asked me for my card, but I told him I didn't have one. He asked me how I entered the library. I said there was no one at the entrance and I didn't know I needed an access card. He asked me where I had been all that time. 
I said on the sixth floor. He got angry telling me I had no right to be there, but I had already been there and I couldn't undo what had happened, so he had to let me leave after a good scolding, of course. You must have gathered a lot of information that you included in your book, The Seals and the Trumpets, you mentioned earlier. Could you in include some of what you found here? Certainly. The value of what I found in the Atlanta Library related to the consequences of what happened on August 11, 1840. According to present-day historians, read Roy the three statements, about three statements that I took from there. The port, like the White House for the Turks, had reacted to the threat of European intervention on behalf of its misgoverned Christian subjects by issuing the Hattie Serif of 1839. But the Quadruple Alliance of 1840, in which Austria and Prussia, but not France, had joined with Britain and Russia to protect the Ottoman Empire's integrity, also implied an unwelcome foreign solicitude about the empire's internal affairs. From then on, European intervention became a regular practice. Externally and formally, the Ottoman Empire, by entering the concert of European powers, had given up its specific character of a Muslim state. Another reference. The years 1840 through 1870 were indeed revolutionary in bringing Turkey and Europe into close contact and in furnishing conditions under which Europe began to exert its influence directly. And the third reference or statement, in the diplomatic arrangements preceding this action, the Ottoman Empire was accepted by the other powers as an equal partner all signed the Convention for the Pacification of the Levant in 1840. In this fashion, the Ottoman Empire was first admitted into the workings of the European state system. I believe it is essential to consider that the Millerites witnessed that historical fulfillment. The news they received left no room for doubt. History confirms that Sultan Abdul Mesil surrendered his independence to the high powers of Europe on that exact day, beginning a secular modernization modeled after Western practices, changing the face of his empire. The Treaty of London, signed on July 15, 1840, by the four major powers of Europe, England, Austria, Prussia, and Russia, was considered an ultimatum because it required the Ottoman Empire to submit to submit if uh, it wanted European protection against the Pasha of Egypt, who was about to overthrow it. This agreement reached Alexandria on August 11, 1840. The sublime port in Constantinople immediately supported the European ultimatum but there was resistance from the Pasha of Egypt. The London Morning Chronicle on September 5, 1840 reported the arrival of the envoy Rifat Bey and Mr. Allison on the steamship Bayer Tahir from Constantinople on the 11th with the ultimatum of the four powers produced a great sensation here. On the same day, August 11, Admiral Lord Robert Stopford ordered Captain Charles Napier to proceed to Beirut. That city was also captured on August 11. James White, L.G. White's husband, expressed it well. The letter is dated Constantinople, August 12. Yesterday, August 11, the Sultan, in his own capital, requested the ambassadors of our nations to know the measures to be taken regarding a circumstance that vitally affected his empire. And he was told only that provision had been made, but he could not know what it was, and he need not be alarmed about any contingency that might arise afterward, 
from that time on, they, not he, would handle it. Where was the Sultan's independence on that day? It was gone. Who had the supremacy of the Ottoman Empire in their hands? The great powers. Therefore, according to the previous calculation, Ottoman supremacy passed on August 11th into the hands of the great Christian powers of Europe. And what did Ellen G. White herself say about the fulfillment of that prophecy? Did she also endorse it? Some say that she did not confirm the fulfillment of the prophetic date reaching 1840, but rather referred to what the Millerites believed at that time. That is not true. In the same chapter 19 of the book, The Great Controversy, she refers to the falling of the stars, meteors, on November 13, 1833, and the cleansing of the sanctuary, the uh, beginning of the cleansing of the sanctuary on October 22, 1844, according to the prophecy of Daniel. With what authority could we affirm then that on those other two foundational dates for the Adventist prophetic faith, she only referred to what the Millerites believed and not to the fulfillment of biblical prophecy. Let's read what Ellen G. White wrote. In 1840, another remarkable fulfillment of prophecy excited widespread, widespread interest. The event exactly fulfill the prediction. Note that she does not say it was simply what the Millerites believed, but another remarkable fulfillment of prophecy. By saying another, she is referring to the other two days, 1833 and 1844. She places their fulfillment on an equal footing. Some objections have been raised to this interpretation. For example, the change from the Julian calendar to the Gregorian calendar in 1582 required a correction of 10 days that the Millerites might not have considered. Also, the prophecy of the five months was fulfilled on January 6, 1449, not exactly on July 27 of that year, where no significant event is found. John Stefanson prepared a master thesis at Andrews University in 2013 titled From Clear Fulfillment to Complex Prophecy, the History of the Adventist Interpretation of Revelation 9 from 1833 to 1957. There, he responded to most of the objections raised in recent years to this extraordinary fulfillment. I summarized some of his answers with modifications and added several more responses in my book, The Apocalyptic Times of the Sanctuary, Biblical, Historical, and Astronomical Confirmation that I published in 2014. Those responses are available on my website and in the study I prepared for the pastoral retreat of the Michigan Conference in 2017 that is also in that website. Let's address, Daniel, the two objections you introduced here. The calendar change we find has nothing to do with a lack of 10 days, but rather to a correction of the calendar. Other cultures have systems that also require regular yearly corrections. The Babylonians and the Hebrews adjusted their calendars every two or three years by adding a 13th month. However, this fact did not alter the count of prophecies that could contain fewer than 365 astronomical days in one year and more in others. To avoid uh, these problems, God simplified the count to 360 thematic days as the basis for prophetic calculation. 
For this reason, the Millerites and the pioneers of the Seventh-day Adventist Church did not feel that the Gregorian calendar correction could affect the prophetic count. On the other hand, if we combine the two prophecies, we don't need to find a fulfillment for the beginning of the sixth trumpet on the exact day of the expiration of the fifth trumpet, but only at the end of the 541 years and 50 days. The specification of 15 days is given for the sixth trumpet, not for the fifth trumpet. While the separate prophecy of five months was fulfilled on January 6, 1449, the two combined prophecies of 541 years and 15 days were fulfilled between July 27, 1299 and August 11, 1840. Moreover, the content of the two trumpets suggests the connection of the two dates because while one says they were to torment without killing, the other says it would be released to kill. The similarity of the two trumpets plus the fact that it was the same invasion leads to the sum of the two dates. In reality, all or most of the prophecies in Daniel and Revelation are interconnected or related in some way. Let's look at the following picture. The 1260 and 1290 years are linked by the point of fulfillment, that is, by the year 1798. Even if we apply the principle of a sliding or variable scale to the sixth trumpet, as seen in other prophetic dates. So I think of the Protestant interpretation that considered the hour as referring to the entire period of judgment of the sixth trumpet, seeing its fulfillment between the fall of Constantinople in 1453 and its fulfillment in 1844. October 22, 1844 was the arrival point of the 2300-day year prophecy of Daniel 814, as well as the arrival point of the 1335-day year prophecy of Daniel 1212. And what about the Protestant interpretation that started the prophecy of the sixth trumpet on May 29, 1453, when Constantinople fell into the hands of the Turks? Was there any significant event regarding the Ottoman Empire 391 years later in 1844? Because this is also the terminal point of the 1335 and the 2300 years. Yes, a considerable number of Protestants predicted the dated fulfillment of the sixth trumpet. You can see it in the following slide. They believed that the arrival point corresponded to the year 1844. Well, on March 21st of that year, the Turkish Sultan Abdul Mesil proclaimed the edict or law of apostasy requiring apostates who converted to is from Islam to Christianity no longer be killed, something that Stratford Canning, a serious Protestant ambassador, from England requested. This implied freedom of conscience to change religion, which, according to the Sultan, was not even practiced in the West, as the sixth trumpet released the Ottoman Turks literally to kill. With this decree, the same Turks pledged not to kill anymore. This was the edict. The Sublime Port engages to take effectual measures to prevent henceforward the execution and putting to death of the Christian who is an apostate from Islam. Henceforward neither shall Christianity be insulted in my dominions, nor shall Christians be in any way persecuted for their religion. So after being subjected to European governments in 1840, did Muslims try to fulfill the dream of the Quran to impose themselves as an empire over the whole world? No. Since the establishment of the United Nations, they have always been subject to the discretion of that organization. 
What we see today are outbursts of fury from the most radical Muslims for not being able to free themselves from subjection to intern international law. Osama bin Laden pathetically expressed it with the following words, as I read it in Clarín, an Argentinian newspaper at that time. We have suffered and continue to suffer because of the United Nations. Those who claim to be Arab leaders and whose countries are members of the United Nations are infidels who betrayed the Quran and the tradition of the Prophet Muhammad because they decided to surrender to international law instead of surrendering to the Quran. So to attempt to organize a third widespread invasive wave against the rest of the world by Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, Saddam Hussein, and the new Islamic State known as ISIS failed. It is evident that these people did not know that their time had already expired. In the next dialogue, we will talk more about current attempts at global dominance when considering the seventh trumpet. Let's now look at the following picture to appreciate the coherence of the historical interpretation offered by Protestants, by Protestants and Millerites and the remarkable parallelism we can see on a sliding scale of prophecy. In 1448, the last emperor of Constantinople requested authorization from the Turkish Sultan to be crowned. And in January 1449, his coronation took place under that authorization. In 1839, the Turks prepared a Tanzimat or Western style constitution to please Europe. And on August 11, 1840, the Turks accepted European conditions to be protected from Egyptian, in Egyptian invasion. On May 29, 1453, the Eastern Roman Empire fell to never rise again. And on March 21, 1844, the Turkish Sultan proclaimed the apostasy edict by which he committed not to persecute or kill Christians who apostatized from Islam. Well, unfortunately, time has gone, but I did want to read two other confirmations by modern historians before we finish today. The Golkain Edict and the reforms marked the start of the legal emancipation of the non-Muslim communities of the empire. The Tanzimat Charter is a turning point in the Ottoman modernization. The premises of the Charter are really new and important. Wow, how incredible. We're in the midst of the seventh trumpet now, no doubt. And the seventh trumpet doesn't have a defined time period because Christ told his followers that no one knows the day nor the hour except his Father in heaven. So to wrap up today, I'd like us to think about the words of Jehoshaphat that he uttered when he saw the fulfillment of the divine promise that destroyed all of his enemies and also by what we were told by the spirit of prophecy. And I'll read. Believe in the Lord your God, and you shall be established. Believe his prophets, and you shall prosper. 2 Chronicles 20, verse 20. In reviewing our past history, having traveled over every step of advance to our present standing, Ellen White writes, I can say, praise God. As I see what the Lord has wrought, I am filled with astonishment and with confidence in Christ as leader. We have nothing to fear for the future except as we shall forget the way the Lord has led us and his teaching in our past history. Councils to the Church, page 359. So, so be, be it. it. Amen.